Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC guy. If your model railroad wiring is a tangled mess like this, then we need to talk fast. And hopefully what I'll show you today will keep your model railroad wiring from ending up looking like this. So let's get started. Hit that little red uh, subscribe button and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Well, what I showed you in the opening might have been something of an exaggeration, but I have seen model railroads that looked almost that bad. It was just a tangled mess under there. And what I want to do today is go over the basics of the requirements for DCC wiring for your model railroad. Because there's a big difference between DC and DCC power and how we wire our model railroads to account for that. So let's go ahead and get started with that. Okay, so one of the basic differences between DC and DCC is that typically you're dealing with a power pack that is rated at under one amp total output. This one right here is rated for 18 volts DC at 17 volt amps. So that's about 0.9 amps output. That's as much as you're going to see on the wires and on the rails. On the other hand, with a DCC booster like this one here, the DCS240, it's rated at 5 or 8 amps. And I've seen DCC boosters that go up to 10 amps. So there's a lot more power being put out on the rails and on the wires in your layout than you're seeing with your typical DC power pack. And that is a major difference in the way that we have to wire. If you're putting 8 amps or 10 amps through a wire that is sized for 1 amp, you can run into problems down the road. Simply because the resistance of the wire to the transmission of the electrical current can create problems for the DCC signal. So what it really comes down to with respect to DC versus DCC is the size of the wires and the length of the runs. Because typically with DC you're using fairly small wires and fairly short runs. With DCC, you have to step it up. I typically recommend for HO scale going with 12 to 16 gauge wire. I use 14 gauge wire here on the Piedmont Southern and other layouts, and I find that it works very well in most scenarios. Now, why would you need 12 gauge? Well, let's say that you've got runs that extend out past 30 feet, 30, 50 feet, something like that. Then you'd better go up to 12 gauge. I know people that use 10 gauge on their model railroad, but they have a 100 foot run. I don't recommend doing that for a number of reasons. And in my book, Wiring Your Model Railroad, I spend a whole chapter talking about things like wire sizes and the effects of it and what you need to use. So take a look at a copy of this. You can get it off of the Combat Hobby Shop website, or you can find this on Amazon as well. So it comes down to a matter then of the size of the wire, but also the size of the rails. And in that book, I provide tables uh, giving you guidelines for the sizes of the wires you need to use with each of the different scales and also the different types of rails, because those vary in conductivity and resistance as well. And the reason for that is your nickel silver rails aren't really made out of silver. They're made out of an alloy of nickel, copper, and I believe zinc in most cases. And the conductivity of those rails is just nowhere near as good as pure copper wire that you would be using for your bus runs. And if you watch the video that I did a few weeks ago on what a DCC signal is comprised of, then you might remember that I said, unlike DC, where you're just shoving electrons through the wire with DCC, it's both power transmission and data transmission. You have that DCC signal as part of what you're sending out on the wire and on the rails. And so you have to have a very, very good wiring setup in order for that to be transmitted without any data losses and without any problems associated with effects to that signal because they can occur. So then basically for a DCC power bus, you need to be thinking about the size of the wires. And for HO scale, I would say you're safe with 14 gauge most of the time, unless your runs get out over 30 feet. And we'll talk about why that 30 feet is important in a minute. 
For end scale, you can go with slightly smaller wires because it's typically a smaller layout, but also your power needs uh, on the layout are not as great as with the larger scales. And once you get up to O scale, then you probably are going to be using by default a 12 gauge wire. And anything larger than that, you might need to go to 10 or something else. Okay, so one thing I've said a couple of times is keep your runs under 30 feet. And that gets into some very complicated uh, electronics when you start talking about why do that. It has something to do with the transmission wavelength and as soon as you get out to 30 feet you're matching that wavelength to some degree and it causes problems when you get past it. I've talked with Larry Meyer at DCC uh, Specialties and he tried to explain it to me but you know it's above my pay grade so I'm not going to try to explain it to you. The important thing is keep your runs under 30 feet if at all possible. If you run out past 30 feet one thing you can do is increase the wire size, but also one thing that is highly recommended is to twist your wires. So let me show you that. So as I said, one of the things you can do is twist your wires. And that means twisting just like this, the bus wires around one another, about three turns per foot. And this is not fun to do. It makes it difficult to actually work with them afterwards. So I don't do this. Instead, I use what's called zip cord. So this is 14 gauge stranded copper wire, and this is what is called OFC wire. It's oxygen free copper, so it is copper. Now be careful when you look for this stuff, and I'll put a link to it in the description as to where I bought this. And be careful because they also sell copper clad aluminum. Don't buy copper clad aluminum. Get the oxygen free copper. It's more expensive, but it's going to be fewer problems in the long run. Now. What is it about the twisting that makes it so important? Well, this is something that was actually invented by Alexander Graham Bell back in the late 1800s when they were having data transmission problems with telephone lines. And he found that by simply twisting the conductors like this, it would eliminate the problem. And the problem really stems somewhat from the fact that when you pass a variable signal like a telephone signal or a DCC signal, through two wires like this, then it creates an electromagnetic field around that wire. And the great thing is, if they're very close together and the signals are mirror images of one another, then they cancel each other out. Plus, that electromagnetic field can prevent crosstalk with other wires near them. So it takes care of a lot of the problems that creep in with telephone lines, but it also works great with DCC as well. And you've probably seen it if you've ever installed Cat5 uh, Ethernet wiring in your house or seen it being done at work. These are some of those cables that come out of that. So you can see this is an Ethernet cable wire and it's a uh, green and a white one and they're wrapped around each other. And this is a whole mess of them that came out of one cable. And what they do that because they want to eliminate the type of problems that can occur when you're passing a variable signal like this through a pair of wires. So it helps to prevent problems and it also helps to prevent crosstalk from adjacent wires. Now, of course, the important thing to remember, though, is in order for this to work, these two wires need to be as close to one another as they can possibly get. And by wrapping them tightly around each other like this, it pretty much guarantees that they are as close as they can get. Because the only thing separating the wires themselves uh, is the insulating jacket. And the same is true with zip cord. Because with zip cord, you've got the two conductors and you've got a vinyl case around it, and they're held together firmly because they are molded that way. So they're not gonna get out of alignment, they're not gonna uh, get out of shape, and they're gonna do the job that you want them to of preventing data transmission errors from creeping in. When you have a variable signal like the DCC signal being transmitted through two wires, uh, if it's not done right, then it can create problems with the signal itself. If you remember, the DCC signal, as shown right here, are very nice square waves. And if you go back and look at that video uh, that I did on DCC signals, and I'll put a link to it above me here and at the end, it shows you exactly what they look like and some of the things that can go wrong. But basically, as long as it's a perfect square wave, there won't be any problems. 
but some of the things that can happen is, is the edge of that square wave can start to become rounded due to wire effects. Uh, you can also get spikes on the uh, occurring at the beginning of the uh, square wave. And one of the things that is built into decoders is part of their programming, they look at that wave. They look at, that, at how square it is. And if it is not a perfect square wave, they can reject that signal. And if you get a lot of those in a, in a row, then you're going to lose control of your locomotive because the decoder is going to say, hey, this is not a valid uh, signal, a valid command, and it's going to ignore it. So that's one of the things that can happen. You can have loss of control of your decoders, your locomotives, simply because these wire effect problems can alter the shape of the DCC signal enough so that the decoder ignores those signals. So that's one of the reasons that you need to be very careful about the type of wiring that you do. Now another thing that I've talked about in the past is the use of snubbers. Now a snubber is, is basically a device that is a resistor and a capacitor, and it's used in order to help keep that signal clean and also to remove uh, transient voltage spikes to a certain degree from the cable. So if, you, if you're running into problems with losses of signal, losses of control of your locomotives, you might need to add a snubber to your DCC wiring. And I did a video on that and I'll try to find it and put a link to it right here above me so that you can go back and take a look at that. They're very easy to make yourself. You can make them for a few pennies and uh, I've shown how to do that. Also, you can buy them. DCC Concepts sells them. The folks at uh, NCE make a snubber that you can buy and install on your model railroad. And they're fairly inexpensive and easy to install. Now, as you probably know, there's solid copper wire and then there's stranded wire. Now, I recommend using the solid wire for situations where it's not going to be flexed a lot. So a typical uh, power bus under your layout, it's just going to hang there. It's not going to be moved around or anything like that. That's a good place to use solid wires. But you can usually use stranded wires there as well. And stranded wires, because they are stranded, they'll flex. And so in places where they might need to be moved a lot, uh, such as on a control panel that you're going to open a lot and move around, then that's a good place to use those. Now, of course, with my zip cord that I use for my DCC power bus, this is stranded wire. But it's not a problem, and you don't have to worry about it. And I also use that with the various uh, 3M suitcase connectors, those kind of things. And you don't have to worry that because you're closing that little suitcase connector on the wires that you're going to break some of the strands. Yeah, it might cut through a couple of strands, but you've got a lot of strands in there and they're in contact with one another, so it really doesn't matter. Now, one thing to do though is make sure that any type of suitcase connector that you do buy can be used with stranded wire. And most of the ones that I've talked about in the past from 3M and the like are compatible with stranded wire. But what can you do if you already have a model railroad that has been wired for DC? Well, the first thing you have to be concerned about, as I said, is the wire size and whether or not it can handle the data transmission and power transmission associated with DCC. Now, one thing that you can do is hook up your DCC command station to the power bus going to your uh, layout, and then just go around the layout and take a large coin like this one here. This is a two pence from the UK, and you can just put that across the rails. I call this a portable short because you can pick it up and take it anywhere you want. You can put it on there and you can test. And what you're going to test for is whether or not your command station shuts down. Because if the wires are too small and you create a short on the layout, then the short may not get transmitted back to your command station. It might just see it as a high load. And so in that case, then you've got a problem because then you're going to need to increase the size of the wires, the number of wires, something in order to get more power out to those areas of the layout. So again, just turn your DCC system on, put your quarter down, put your large coin down on the rails, and just move around your layout all over and check just like that to see whether or not you've got any signal getting through there. Because otherwise, you're living on borrowed time without it. Now, another thing you can do 
is if you have one of these uh, voltage amp meters produced by DCC Specialties, you can just put that on the rails and go along and check the readout and see what the voltage does. Because as you move away from your source of power, if you've got high resistance on the rails and in your wires, then that voltage readout is going to decrease. Now, if you don't have one of these, another thing you can do is take your, uh, your little voltage meter, put it on AC, and then go around the layout, touching the probes to the rails the same way, and check the voltage and see whether or not that voltage stays the same as you go around the layout. Because if the wires are inadequate, then the resistance is going to decrease the voltage as you get further and further away from your source of power. That brings in another question, feeders. One of the things that you need to be aware of is the distance between the feeders that you install on your model railroad between the power bus and the track itself. Now, typically with HO scale code 83 to code 100, I would say you want to have feeders every six to eight feet. When you get down to something like code 70, code 75, something that mid-range, then you're going to probably want to go up to about three to six feet. And if you get smaller, down around code 55 or so, then you're definitely at three feet and less. And the reason for that is that the smaller the rail, then the higher the resistance to transmission of the DCC power. The DCC power has to go between the two feeders. So if you have a pair of feeders here and a pair of feeders here, then that distance between them and the size of the rails is going to determine the amount of resistance there is to the passage of the current through there. So for very large rails like code 83, code 100, you can get away with a greater distance in between the feeders. With smaller stuff like code 55, you're going to need to reduce that distance proportionally in order to allow more electricity to flow between these two feeders on these rails. So that's something that has to be considered when you're putting these things together. Well, that's a wrap for today's video. So to wrap this up, make sure that your wires are large enough diameter for the amperage that is going to be flowing through them. Make sure that you have adequate number of feeders for the size of the rails that you're using on your model railroad, because all of those things come into play. Keep your runs 30 feet or less, and you won't even have to worry about doing twisted pairs, that kind of thing. It's only when you get out past 30 feet that you have to worry about twisted pair wiring. Now, like I said though, you can use that zip cord like I showed you a minute ago and like I use, and I'll put a link to it here uh, in the description, and you can order that and use that, and it won't matter whether it's 30 feet or 50 feet, you'll be covered. So that's it for today's video. In future videos, we'll be taking a look at individual wiring projects just to fill in some of the gaps in between. So have a great weekend, have a great week. I'll see you here next week with another video from the DCC Guy. Bye now.